Hey everybody, it's that time of the week again. It's Steam Deck news time. Uh, there's a lot to cover in this video, so uh, let's just get into the news, shall we? The first thing that I want to talk about is that iFixit has actually launched the Deck Replacement Parts Store, uh, and with it, they've also created comprehensive guides to repairing almost every aspect of your Steam Deck. I love to see this. Valve is keeping their word. They've partnered with iFixit to sell replacement parts and kits, and they even doubled down and added Valve Index parts here. That's so cool. Now, I did a video a few days ago about the iFixit repair parts leak that happened, uh, and then the same night that that video went up, iFixit actually released their final store pages uh, for these components. And most of them sold out incredibly quickly, with iFixit saying, quote, many Steam Deck parts listings are live and we'll have more coming online in the next few weeks. Demand has been very high and we've already sold out of our initial stock of some components. Rest assured, more are on the way. Now, iFixit had a very interesting write-up about the deck and its repairability, and it was a fascinating read. Quote, the Steam Deck team is very excited about this program. We designed Steam Deck to be repairable, and it just makes sense for us to work with iFixit to enable customers to repair and replace parts on their own. But I think my favorite thing about iFixit is their integrity. Despite being a partner with Valve and distributing the deck's replacement parts, they're more than willing to call Valve out when they don't meet the mark. In particular, the deck's battery. Quote, Valve didn't hit everything on our wish list, but the Steam Deck netted a very respectable 7 out of 10 repairability score. Topping our wish list is a more accessible battery. Batteries have a limited lifespan, and replacing them should be considered basic maintenance. Unfortunately, the Steam Deck's battery is glued in place and buried under several fragile flex cables that must be carefully coaxed aside. We often recommend attacking strong adhesives with isopropyl alcohol, but in this case, that's not a good idea. It'll leak through the holes in the frame underneath, potentially endangering the display. Instead, you'll want to use a lot of forceful prying and or heat, which is why we've rated battery replacement difficult. It's definitely doable, and we're glad to walk you through the procedure, but we wish that it was easier. A glued-in battery isn't an uncommon design choice, especially when capacity is paramount, but it's a bummer to see in an otherwise repair-friendly device. Valve's commitment to the repairability of the deck is pretty huge. It's absolutely brilliant to see that. Next up, we have ProtonUp QT. Now, this is a phenomenal front-end tool that assists users in their journey to customizing Steam Play. And I say Steam Play instead of Proton because ProtonUp QT does more than just Proton. In their latest release, ProtonUp QT has added support for Bottles. And if you're unfamiliar, Bottles is a wine and Proton manager that I've used in previous videos like this one, where I updated my DualSense firmware with the PC utility that was not made for Linux. <laughs> but the fact is, ProtonUp QT doesn't just do Proton and wine, it also assists you by adding the phenomenally cool Luxtrapedia to your arsenal of compatibility tools. Now, if you're not familiar, Luxtrapedia is a tool which lets you run some of your favorite Steam games using an available native version. Open source games, source ports, free and open source re-implementations, even stuff like ScumVM and DOSBox. Luxtrapedia takes advantage of all of these. Some games that work with Luxtrapedia are Ion Fury using the native build of eDuke32, the Rollercoaster Tycoon series using OpenRCT2, Star Wars Next to the Old Republic using Re1 Engine, Elder Scrolls Morrowind using OpenMW, Unreal Tournament 2004 using the original Linux binaries, which are missing from the Steam release, and so much more. Luxtrapedia is awesome. Next up, let's talk about Sony. Now, by 2025, Sony expects to have at least one third of their releases launching on PC as well. This is pretty exciting since it means that we'll have many Sony exclusive titles available on the Steam Deck. Sony cites the success that they've seen with titles like God of War, Days Gone, and Horizon Zero Dawn on PC. And while those first party titles are really cool, I'd also like to see Uncharted and Spider-Man make their way to PC as well. And it would be nice if PC ports could arrive at around the same time that they launched for PlayStation. <laughs> Next up, Psychonauts 2. So this is interesting. Psychonauts 2 now has a native Linux build a year after it was released for Windows. Now ProtonDB lists this title as Platinum and has a playable deck rank uh, for requiring manually invoking the keyboard on the Steam Deck. As Gaming on Linux pointed out, the game's developers added some rather peculiar instructions on the game's boot problems. Quote, 
The game may crash at launch or when attempting to alter display settings such as window mode. Please try the following troubleshooting solutions. Use alternative display drivers found in software and updates and additional drivers, which is Ubuntu specific. Go to settings and appearances and then reposition the activities bar to the bottom of the screen, which what? Use an alternative desktop environment such as GNOME on Xorg or Ubuntu on Wayland, which and try changing the resolution with the resolution scaling slider found in the settings graphics menu. Weird. Weird, 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 weird. But anyway, I think it would be interesting to run Psychonauts 2's Windows build through Proton against the native build. If you'd like to see that, make sure you leave a comment below and let me know. And maybe I should try a few games alongside that. Let me know in the comments, what games should I try? Now, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Are you enjoying this video? Maybe like that smash button and squeeze that subscribe button. I'm trying to hit 100,000 subscribers by the end of the summer and with your help, I know we can do it. And thanks. Next up, SteamOS 3.2 update has been live since Thursday, and I've had the chance to put it through its paces. I know I say this almost every time there's an update, but this one is really a game changer. I'm serious. I mean, not only does this update include the revised fan curve that the beta channel has been playing with for at least a few weeks now, but it also has the refresh rate options that should seriously help with battery life and perceived smoothness of AAA titles on the deck. If you're not familiar, the refresh rate option that I'm talking about is actually described pretty succinctly in the update announcement post. Quote, players now have the option to adjust the in-game screen refresh rate on the fly. The default is 60 hertz, which can be frame limited to 60, 30, and 15 FPS. But you can now slide it down to 40 with frame limits of 40, 20, and 10 frames per second, or any number integer between these two. This feature is great for finding the perfect balance between frame rate, game quality, and battery life. Pro tip, we have found that 40 hertz tends to be a sweet spot for responsiveness, consistency, and smoothness. And of course, you can save this setting on a per game basis. Now, a rock solid 40 FPS in game with a 40 hertz updating screen means that every frame is a new frame, and as a result, it can feel smoother than an inconsistent frame rate with a higher screen refresh. In addition, locking frame rate lower puts less demand on the system and thus saves battery life. While 40 hertz will use more battery than 30 hertz, it will use less than a game capped at a higher refresh rate, while still giving a subjectively far higher quality of an experience comparatively. But those aren't the only changes with SteamOS 3.2. There's now more internal screen resolutions to choose from, uh, micro SD cards now quick format, and there's tons of audio improvements, including a higher maximum volume. But it doesn't end there, because there was also a Steam Deck client update launching alongside the SteamOS client update, and it brought a host of new features and fixes as well. First, the client will now warn you if you have less than two gigabytes of storage left on the internal storage device. Next, you can now close windows if the game or application has more than one open, account switching has been added to the power menu, and the biggest fix is that remote play together is now 100% functional on the deck. I was able to play a game of Assault Android Cactus with my pal Fan the Deck, and it was so much fun. Check out his channel, by the way, he's great. He was hosting on his deck and I was player two on mine. It worked really well after I disabled background downloads while playing the game, and as expected when streaming, there was no fan noise whatsoever on my deck. Anyway, it's so fun to see the active development that's going on at Valve with the Steam Deck, and I can't wait to see what they come up with next. Well, that's the Steam Deck news for this week. Hopefully y'all enjoyed this video. If you did, get subscribed to stay up to date with all the cool stuff that we're doing here on the channel. Now, I wanna give a special shout out to Matt Dancer, one of my top tier Singularity members. It's because of people like Matt that I've been able to grow this channel into what it is today. If you believe in the work that I'm doing and you wanna help support this show and help it continue to grow, you can use the links below to pledge your monthly support and become a Linux warrior. And thank you. I think that's gonna do it for this video though. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you all have a blessed day and I'll see you next time.